In this episode, I wanted to talk about why you should be using a wiki for storing internal documentation, things like policies and procedures, tech notes, as well as other information about your infrastructure. Then in the latter part of the episode, we will cover how to install MediaWiki on a CentOS 6.4 box, as well as give a brief demo of how the application works. So why is an internal wiki useful? Well, speaking from personal experience, before using a wiki, I had information scattered all over the place. In my home directory, emails, shared drive, post-it notes, and probably worst of all, stuck in my head. And a wiki gave me a central location where not just me, but the entire company started to consolidate information. Plus, having everything in one place makes it easy to find and update documents. I just wanted to illustrate the problem and how using a wiki solves it. So before using a wiki, I would typically work on a document locally, then email it out to various members on a team asking for feedback. You fairly quickly get burdened as each person replies with an updated document and their changes. Now it's up to me to merge all these changes manually and send out an updated version. And the cycle continues, till eventually the final version goes into a shared drive to live where no one looks at it. But using the wiki model, I found myself publishing documents quicker because I could write a quick draft, send it out, and everyone else could just edit the document online. I think this leads to a much quicker feedback cycle, and if you ever need to find a document, the wiki has a great search function. I should mention that I'm using the term document pretty loosely here. When I talk about wiki documents, I'm not talking about pages with uh, documents attached. I'm referring to documents as the actual pages. So you essentially eliminate documents and churn most everything into internal wiki pages. Rather than listen to me talk all about wikis, let's just go ahead and install MediaWiki on a CentOS 6.4 virtual machine so that I can show you what they look like in real life. First, let's install the required dependencies, things like HTTPD, PHP, and MySQL Server, along with several supporting packages. Do not worry about copying any of these commands down, they are all listed in the episode notes below. Now that we have those installed, let's start the MySQL server, which will act as the data store for our wiki. Since this is a fresh install of the MySQL server, there is a bunch of output letting us know that we should configure a root password. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm just going to copy this command, which basically says, use MySQL admin, connect as root, and set the password to new password. As you can see down here, I've updated it, but with a much longer password. Now that we've set the default password, let's go ahead and connect to MySQL so that we can create a wiki database along with a wiki user, which the MediaWiki installer will use later. From here, let's list the databases so that we can get a lay of the land. Then let's create our database by running create database wiki. Then we can list the databases again just to verify that we actually created it. Great. Now let's create the wiki user account. This step is not required, but I highly recommend it. This just gives us a little added security, say for example, that someone compromised this account. They should not be able to access other databases. So in this command, I'm saying create user wiki at localhost, and it's identified by this password. Next, let's grant some permissions to this wiki user. This command says grant these permissions to the wiki database and all of its tables again to the wiki user. This allows us to give fine-grained controls to a specific account. Lastly, let's flush the privileges and exit. This next step is not required either, but I highly recommend doing it if you're running HTTPD and MySQL servers on the same host. Basically, we're going to configure MySQL to only listen for local connections and not allow any external access. This helps protect the MySQL server from attacks over the network because it's not listening for any traffic. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's run netstat-nap and pipe the output to grep, capital L-I-S-T. We're going to look for processes that are listening for connections. You can see that MySQLD is listed here and it is listening on all addresses on port 3306. We can restrict this to local hosts by editing the MySQL configuration file located in slash Etsy. Under the MySQLD section, let's add a key value pair called bind-address equals 127.0.0.1 or localhost. Next, let's restart MySQLD so that it sees the updated settings. Then let's rerun the netstat-nap command to verify our changes. 
As you can see, the MySQL D process is now listening for connections on localhost only. That means that nothing from the external network can connect. Let's make sure HTTPD and MySQL are started on boot. We can do this by running check config dash dash list MySQL D and we'll do the same for HTTPD. You will notice that in both of these instances they are set to be off by default. So let's go ahead and change these by running check config the service name and then on. Since we already started MySQL D earlier to configure the database, it's already running. But let's go ahead and start HTTPD now. Now that we have HTTPD and MySQLD sorted out, let's go ahead and download the MediaWiki software. I would normally recommend installing this via RPM, but there doesn't appear to be an up-to-date version available. I provided the download link in the episode notes below, but I'm just going to copy the link and then use wget in the terminal to download it. So now that we have it downloaded, let's move this over to slash var slash www slash html. Then let's go ahead and unpack it. The MediaWiki directory has the incorrect owner and group, so let's go ahead and run chown to recursively change the ownership to the Apache user and group. Then as always, let's go ahead and verify that it worked. Now this next step is up to your personal preference, but I like to create a symbolic link from the MediaWiki directory to a better known name, for example, wiki. The reason why I create a symbolic link is that the version information is preserved, so it is clear to anyone who looks what version we're actually running. And if you want to upgrade, you just need to download the latest, unpack it, and then update the link. You will commonly see people using Apache config files to set up this redirect, but I like using this method. One last thing before we start the MediaWiki install wizard. If you're running an IP tables firewall like me, then you most likely need to add a rule to allow HTTPD traffic over port 80. We can do that by editing slash etsy slash sysconfig slash iptables. We can just copy this port 22 rule that allows SSH and modify it for port 80. Then let's run service iptables restart to refresh the firewall rules. We can verify that the new rule exists by running the iptables capital L N command again. As you can see, our port 22 rule is here and our port 80 rule is here. Okay, now that we have all the plumbing figured out, let's fire up our web browser and connect to localhost. You'll notice that I'm connected to localhost colon 8080. This is because I'm using a virtual machine, but in your situation, this might just be localhost or the remote address of your server. So let's go ahead and navigate to the slash wiki directory, which we configured earlier using the symbolic link. This looks promising. Let's go ahead and click the setup the wiki link. From this point on, we're working with the wizard, which will walk us through configuring the wiki. First off, we're prompted to select the language. I'm just going to go ahead and change these to EN. Next, we are given a rundown of our environment. You would likely be prompted here if you forgot something, but since we installed all of the requirements, it says we can safely move forward with the install. In this step, we're prompted to configure the database. Let's just update these fields with our MySQL settings from earlier. The database host is localhost, the database name is wiki, and the database user is also wiki. And then let's just paste our really long password from earlier. And then let's continue with the installer. These settings already looked good, so I just hit continue. Here we're prompted for the wiki name, and we can also specify who the admin user will be. For the wiki name, I'm just going to call it my wiki for now. Then we can just fill in the admin details down here. If you're in a hurry, you're allowed to bypass the following steps, but let me just show you what they look like. Next, you can define how email is handled, maybe include some additional extensions or define a company logo, but I'm just going to click continue to move forward with the install. In this step, it looks like the installer populated the database, so we can safely just hit continue to move forward with the install. Great, it looks like the install was successful and we're prompted to download a file called localsettings.php, which it says we need to save into slash var slash www slash html slash wiki, the directory that we created earlier. This file essentially holds all of the settings which the installer helped us choose. So let's go ahead and save the file. I'm just going to change into that directory. 
Then let's populate the local settings.php file. Let's just list the file contents again to make sure that it was actually created. Yep, looks like it worked. So let's head back to the browser and click the enter your wiki link. Great, it looks like it's working. You will notice that the interface looks exactly like Wikipedia, so it should be fairly easy to get used to. Let's quickly go over some common interface features. You can read, edit, and view the change history along with search the wiki. Then over here are your navigation links. These can be updated to better fit your company. And you can also change the logo via the local settings.php file we were just looking at. First, let's go ahead and edit the main page. Let's just highlight all the text and get rid of it. Let's create a listing of several topics that you're likely to track using the wiki. Let's start with, say, meeting minutes. And then how about project plans? And finally, technical documentation. Then let's save the page. It's really that easy to get going. You can also view the change history for every page by going to the View History tab. Down here you'll find a listing of all the changes, who made them, and when, along with a way to visually see what the changes were. Let's have a look. As you can see, we have the previous version on the left here, and then over here on the right we have the new version. Let's head back to the main page for a minute. We created these listings, but none of these links go anywhere. So let's fix that by editing the page again. We can create links by adding double brackets around text, or you can just highlight it and select this icon. Let's do that for each of these items and then save the page. You will notice that all the items are in red now. This indicates that these are links, but the destination page does not exist yet. You can create the destination page simply by clicking the link. Let's try this out for the meeting minutes page. I'm just going to copy some text in here. This indicates a heading, and then down here we have an itemized list of some dates. These are some example meeting dates. Then let's save the page. Now you can say we have our newly created meeting minutes page, with our nice heading, along with the listing of links. Let's head back to the main page again. You will see that the meeting minutes link is now in blue, and if you click it, you go to the meeting minutes page. This pretty much wraps up this episode. Hopefully you will embrace using a wiki for managing your internal documentation, especially now that you know they're so useful. Alright, that concludes this episode. Thanks for watching. If you would like to get notified about future episodes, please subscribe to my mailing list. You can do this by going to the Get Notified link in the header and entering your email address. Have questions, comments, or concerns about this episode? What about episode ideas? I'd love to hear your feedback, either good or bad. Shoot me an email, justin at sysadmincasts.com.